Uh, I'm here with the Professor Alan Kong at ICTP. Uh, he's visiting in conjunction with the workshop on non-commutative geometry. Uh, so the first question would be yes. sort of an ICTP specific question. In yes. this. If you had advice to give yes. young students who want to study math, yes. uh, in particular young students from developing countries, right. uh, what advice would you give them? Oh, wow, that's difficult. I mean, you know, um, to study math, of course, it's a uh, you know, very challenging thing. Uh, and uh, somehow, I mean, I have always thought that uh, uh, you, you, so the key step in studying mathematics is uh, to understand that, uh, you know, you don't learn mathematics. You, you, you make, you do it. You do it, and until you you are really able to take a problem and solve it by yourself, or try to solve it by yourself, you are not doing mathematics. I mean, because learning, there are topics that you can learn. I mean, there are some even scientific topics that you can learn, but this is not the case for mathematics. For mathematics, you have to do it yourself. So that would be the best, you know, what I could say in a very short time. But uh, so it's a little bit like, for instance, you know, if you try to, if you to make comparison, if you try to to become a pianist by reading books, you will never get anywhere. <laughs> it's the same story. <laughs> you have to practice. The practice is far more important than whatever uh, reading in books you find out. So in that way, it's a very uh, democratic uh, subject. And uh, I mean, there is a key step also, which I mean, the manifestation of this key step is when a student in a room uh, uh, finds a mistake of the teacher because he is able to think by himself or by herself and, uh, and find out that uh, he is right and the uh, teacher is wrong. So, this is something which is very important in mathematics and which is different from other topics. Because there are other topics that require so much knowledge. That uh, somehow this would not be possible for people to learn to do that. But the best way to explain it So, the next question is yes. uh, thinking about this quest to find a unified theory of uh -huh. the universe. Um, I think it, it's interesting the impact that maybe this has had on the interaction between math and physics. Yes. And so, maybe some had a perspective that at one time one field said another, but it seems that now there's sort of a symbiotic relationship, and I wanted your perspective on the evolution of the relationship between math and physics. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, it's a very delicate uh, issue in the sense that uh, there is one graal, one problem which people are, are been trying to solve, which is uh, the quantum gravity. So we know that quantum gravity to exist, we know that uh, it's quite difficult. But um, in a way, if you want to, for a mathematician, the, at least as far as I'm concerned, the issue is even more uh, important for mathematics in the following sense. That, for instance, when Riemann wrote his, uh, gave his inaugural talk, it was very clear on the fact that uh, the hypothesis that he had for the Manian geometry, the hypothesis of geometry, would no longer hold at a very, very small scale. And uh, he was so lucid and, uh, and uh, precise that he was already foreseen developments that would come much later, and in particular in the of geometry, because of the fact you know, that. Uh, uh, the notion of a solid body or the notion of a ray of light no longer makes sense in the very, very small. Whereas it was it were these notions that were crucial in his definition of geometry. So there is a symbiosis. There is a symbiosis, but there are also, I would say, deviations. And uh, and uh, what I hear, for instance, when I read some talks, I hear deviations because some people just want to change the rules of physics just because they are so that so, so I think one has to be very careful. And uh, at the same time, I would, what I would say is that uh, there is an intermediate goal to contemporary, and that goal is very precise, is to understand the 
effect, the impact on the evolution of geometry that the uh, experimental physics has provided for us in one century, where the inward bound trip uh, was beginning at the end of the 19th century with the discovery of the electron uh, of radioactivity. And by, we have increased our perception of the small structure of space-time by a factor of 10 to the power 8 in, the, in this century. And that has implications on the geometric model we have of space-time. And that implication has been fully understood in no of geometry. And what happens is that space-time is no longer a purely continuum, but it's a mixture of the continuum and the discrete. And uh, so this is a lesson that was uh, uh, understood. And uh, it's a lesson which very, very strangely forced to change the Riemannian paradigm. But this change in the Riemannian paradigm, uh, of course, Riemann couldn't force it because it involves the quantum mechanics. So, so the new paradigm on geometry is very close to the Riemannian one. But there are nuances, and these nuances come from uh, the quantum. They come from the uh, formalism of quantum mechanics, which has been discovered by uh, from uh, in the 1970s. And, uh, and it turns out then that the idea of you know, the notion of geometric space becomes more natural and more uh, easy to understand in the quantum formalism. So yeah, you, you described that it's not just the immensity of the universe, but also these very small scales that have become yeah. quite... How would you define a point? Okay, that's an interesting question, uh, because uh, we can ask even a, a preliminary question to that, uh, is point. And, uh, and that question is simple, how do we communicate with uh, extraterrestrial possible simulations, the place where we are? You see, if I tell you that we are in Trieste, okay, so, well, that won't help because, uh, first of all, these people, they won't understand what we're talking about. <laughs> they won't understand our language as well. And, uh, and then you would have people who would tell you, because they know general relativity, we just have to give our coordinates in some coordinate system. But that's also foolish, because which coordinate system do you take and which invariant way do you have to communicate your, your coordinate system? And it turned out that what I was talking about before, namely this uh, re-understanding of geometry, is exactly providing you with the answer to two questions. The first question is, how do we communicate the space in which we are? Okay. Just globally, mm -hmm. not by giving a picture. How do we communicate the space in which we are? And second of all, how do we define the point? Okay. So how do we communicate the space in which we are? Turns out that uh, the best way is to give the music of the, of the space. So if you take a shape, I mean, this is a well-known uh, uh, metaphor, if you want, uh, which goes back to Mark Arts and people. So if you give a shape, like uh, a drum, for instance, or if you give a you know, drum of various shapes and so on, it turns out that each of, that, of these shapes has a special scale, musical scale, which is assigned to Only which frequencies are the proper frequencies of the shape. And uh, it turns out that uh, you want to give invariant in the space, you have to give a list of quantities which are assigned to the space in an invariant manner. Now the scale of the space is invariantly defined because you can rotate the space, you can do whatever you want, you will not change its scale. You can take a drum, you can move it to another place, it will have the same scale. Okay. So this is an invariant of the space and, uh, and it turns out that uh, well, Helmholtz found the so-called Helmholtz equation that gives you the scale of the space, space. But it turns out there is a small refinement in that, which is that Helmholtz was taking like the square root of Laplacian, and you have to replace this by the Dirac domain. But this is a small nuance. And once you know this small nuance, then you can actually reconstruct the space, but you need to know a little more. So you need to know a little more than the scale of the space you need to know precisely what are the points. And what are the points? Each point is defined by a chord on the scale. Okay, so the point in the space, technically speaking, 
how do you specify a point? So technically speaking, what you do, you take what are called the eigenvectors for the Dirac operators. They are, they are sections of some bundle of the space, and you evaluate them at a point. Now, when you evaluate them, you cannot just get a number. So to get a number, you take the matrix, which are the scalar products of these various sections at the point. This gives you a matrix. And it turns out that uh, uh, modulo is the various of various matrix. I mean, this, this matrix is exactly what you need to do the point. So the picture, the meta picture that you should have is that in this understanding, in this understanding, the space is understood by a musical scale and possible chords. And the possible chords are the points. So, uh, in a way, what happens is that you reconstitute the space by a kind of Fourier transform. And uh, I believe that this is exactly what the brain does when we, we see, because when we see, we have the photons which are encoding the moment of space, eigenstate. And the brain reconstitutes the space like we are used to see. But what is even more important is that this is exactly the way we perceive the distant universe. Because we perceive the distant universe by looking at spectra of uh, galaxies, of spectra of stars, of spectra of uh, nebulae, and uh, and uh, and it is thanks to the spectra that we have the, the kind of information that we get from far distant distances of the universe. So uh, in this formalism, we find out that not only it's useful for microscopic distances, but it also reshuffles and uh, changes the point of view on the large distances, but in a way which is perfectly coherent with our perception of the universe. For instance, you know, typically, what happens is that uh, we know that uh, things are very, very distant. Uh, you have to remember that there was some time where people didn't even know that there were things outside uh, our galaxy. Okay, and it took uh, you know, very bright uh, astronomers to find that. But uh, now we know that things are very, 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 very distant uh, just because of the redshift. So, and this is again the spectral, uh, spectral problem. And here there's a concept of distance, a unit yes. of length sure. in terms of wavelength. Sure, sure. That, that's also a very, very important step, that, uh, which is so much fun to, to explain because it, it relates to very concrete stuff. So the story starts uh, in France, more or less, during the French Revolution, you see, there were, uh, more or less, there was a unit of length per city. Or, uh, there, was, uh, there were at least 1,000 units of length in France. So, which means that when people were selling, for instance, tissue and traveling from one place to another, they had to measure with respect to the unit that was at the entrance of the village. Of, the city. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So, I mean, because you know the revolution was uh, uh, an idea to uh, of course unify things and uh, they had grand purposes and all that they decided to to and they had very good uh, scientists so they decided to try and unify the system by uh, defining a unit of length that would be so what did they do they they took the largest available object which is the earth and they defined the unit of length so that when you multiply this unit of length by uh, by uh, 40 billions, billions, you obtain the uh, circumference of the Earth. Okay. So this is what they tried. And in order, of course, they couldn't go to the pole or you know, go to the full area. But what they did is they looked at the stars and they measured angles. And so they, they just needed to measure a certain angular portion of the meridian. And they chose the meridian portion, which was between Dunkerque, which is in the north of France, and uh, Barcelona, which is in Spain. And uh, in, uh, in uh, 1792, so this was a full you know, uh, revolution, so on, they sent uh, two people, uh, Delambre and Michel, were sent out to uh, uh, do the following. The idea was that they would uh, they would first of all have a base, what we call a base. So they had light down on a sufficiently long distance, some bars, if you want, and uh, 
and they had taken that as a base. Now, they were only measuring angles, which is a very smart idea. So they, what they were doing, they were putting the telescopes on tops of hills and so on, measuring angles. And by doing triangulation, they were comparing the base with the distance between uh, Barcelona and Dunkirk. And out of that was defined the unit of length, okay, which was uh, actually a little bar. It was a very interesting story because there were all sorts of developments in this story. One of them was that uh, one of the guys, I think it was Michel, I don't know, uh, had to make measurements in Spain. And of course, so he, he was measuring angles with uh, his, uh, you know, by uh, putting a telescope on top of the hill and so on. And of course, he had lots of trouble because there was a war between French and, uh, France and Spain at the time, and he had to explain to the Spanish army that uh, uh, by putting his telescope on top of the hill and uh, looking through his telescope, he was not a spy, <laughs> but he was trying to define the unit of length. <laughs> so there were all sorts of very interesting developments. I love to tell these stories, I don't know why, but... Uh, and uh, then what happened was uh, the following. So this uh, unit of length was actually deposited near Paris, and when I was a kid, I learned the unit of length is the meter which is deposited in Pavillon de Breteuil near Paris. <laughs> so, okay. so I was thinking, and I'm sure many people were thinking, you know, this is not very practical because if you want to measure your bed, you have to. <laughs> of course, they made duplicates of this <laughs> meter and all that. <laughs> so that's what, uh, what was the situation at the time. But, uh, but then some very interesting events happened. So there were periodic meetings of the uh, metric system people. And these meetings have been going on very periodically for years and years and years. I'm not sure that the period was one year, it perhaps was three years, something like that. But around the 1970s, what happened was that uh, uh, they noticed that actually the platinum bar, which was defining the internet, was changing next. And that was very bad. And how did they notice that? Because they noticed that by actually measuring its length very precisely, by comparing it with a Krypton uh, wavelength for a specific transition of Krypton. So that was uh, very bad. And, uh, and uh, gradually, they, 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 took, they decided to take the right step. And the right step, of course, was to take this wavelength as a definition of, uh, of the limit of length. So that took some time, that took some time, but uh, what is very interesting to know is that now there are instruments which are sold in the, uh, you can buy them in the, in the shop, and uh, these instruments are based again on the wavelengths. It's no longer, the one which is used is not crypto, it's cesium, because cesium turns out to be available uh, very easily uh, uh, sold, and moreover, the wavelength of uh, cesium, which is used, uh, uh, is, a, is a microwave. So it's like when you put something in the microwave oven. It's a wavelength which is of the order of three centimeters. And uh, it, it is an instrument which allows you to measure lengths uh, up to 12 decimals. So I mean, it, it's absolutely incredible. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, this is now what is taken as a unit of length. Of course, you know, people will tell you it's not a unit of length, it's a unit of time. But because of uh, the constancy of speed of light, I mean, the two uh, speed of light has been fixed to a very specific number. Okay, so so things have evolved, and now what you see from that is that there was a complete change in the paradigm because the unit of length is no longer a localized object, which is somewhere, but it's a spectral data. And it turns out that the new paradigm, which comes from quantum mechanics, which is a paradigm of non-commutative geometry, which is called spectral geometry, if you want, is exactly parallel to this change of uh, paradigm in physics. So it's very concrete. It's something which is very, very concrete. And uh, the advantage, the enormous advantage, is that if we add to, for instance, uh, unify the metric system, not on Earth, but in the galaxy, mm -hmm. for instance, you know, if you would tell to people, okay, come to Paris and compare with, <laughs> with the unit of lengths we have defined there, I mean, they would laugh at you. I mean, there would be wars, actually, because people would say, well, we have our unit of lengths and so on. Okay? Whereas, if you tell to people, take a chemical element, 
Of course, cesium is a little bit complicated because the cesium, for robustness, wouldn't it yeah, maybe yes. have something very common? In the yeah, industry? exactly, like helium or hydrogen. Mm -hmm. I, I would I would vote for hydrogen because hydrogen <laughs> is essentially present anywhere, whereas mm -hmm. cesium or heavy elements of that kind. In fact, one has to know that they only come not only from supernova but from very very exceptional supernova. So so. Their abundance in the universe is not so clear. But if you take hydrogen, for instance, there are spectral rays of hydrogen, which are very pre precisely defined, they have a very specific pattern. And, uh, but then one would have to find hyperfine splitting, because the advantage of hyperfine splitting, which is used for cesium, is that an hyperfine splitting is a difference of energy which is very, very small. And that would, uh, in, in the inverse law, when you pass to the wavelengths, it will generate microwaves. So, which is much more practical. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you take you know, a huge difference of frequency, like uh, for a transition and so on, you would get a very, very tiny unit of length. That, that, would, that would be good. Okay, but uh, what I'm saying is that, you know, if you communicate with people, to people with a probe, by sending a probe, and if you are able to tell them what is your unit of length, ah, this is marvelous. Mm -hmm. and, and you just send uh, a copy of the spectral rays of hydrogen and, and you explain. Of which one you want to, to find out. I mean, this is very simple. If they are smart, they will understand. Okay. I mean, whereas, okay, whatever you do otherwise, wouldn't work. And in this description of the, of the fine structure of space time, right. you, you describe it in terms of the spectrum of an operator, which right. It's a little bit more complicated. I mean, it, as I said, you know, of course, the, the, the spectrum of the operator gives you the unit of length. So, so uh, but this allows you, in a way, yes. to combine a discrete concept with a continuous. Yeah. Concept. Well, what allows to combine the discrete and the continuum is the fact that essentially it's a mixture of the discrete and the continuum, and uh, and what uh, if you want the, what the, the discoveries of experimental physics have uh, unveiled over the century is exactly what is the structure of this discrete space. So at first, the discrete space it was my collaborators, uh, Shamsedi. Uh, uh, and uh, Walter von Selikov and some kind of uh, what we found at first we were, we were proceeding as a from the bottom up approach namely we were taking from experiment and trying to fit with what was going on and so on and gradually we found what the finite space should be but in a recent work about two or three years ago with uh, uh, Shamsedi and Mukhanov uh, we were very amazed because we were asking a, a purely geometric problem uh, which was uh, motivated, of course, by non-computative geometry, but which was totally disjoint from the physics and the standard model and so on. And by developing this problem in dimension four, we found exactly the same uh, finite space and the same algebra that was put in by hand before. So we believe that we have a piece of the truth. Okay. Well, naively, why is it important to yes. to include this discrete concept? Okay, in why the naively is it is important? This is uh, easy to explain. So now I, but I need a piece of paper. I can see. <laughs> Maybe, uh, oh yes, here is a piece of paper. So that's, it, it's very easy to understand. You see, uh, 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 why is it important to have this discrete piece? Okay, uh, it's to uh, the, the most uh, obvious. Uh, uh, problem that you have, if you don't have this discrete piece, is that the Higgs boson, the Braut Engler Higgs, I knew Braut very much, I mean he died just one year before the, the particle was discovered, but particle is discovered, we know it's there, but it doesn't fit with standard geometry, why? Because in standard geometry, if you take a function on a space, okay, you will differentiate it and you will get what is called a, a gauge potential, a, a one, a one form, okay? And uh, why? Because the differentiation depends on the direction in which you differentiate. So this is why you get something which is called of spin one, if you want, which is uh, uh, which depends on the direction. But the Braut Engler X uh, particle is a particle which is of spin zero, so it doesn't depend on the direction. So you wonder how can you uh, obtain geometrically a particle of spin zero? Okay. Now imagine that instead of having just this manifold, okay, there is a discrete element, and the discrete element is just telling me whether I am on the top or on the bottom. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So now I, I have more information. I know whether I am on the top or on the bottom, and I take a function. Now this function will have a value, will have a development here, and it will have a development under. They don't have to be the same. 
Okay? So I can differentiate my function up, I can differentiate it down, but I can also take the finite difference across. And the finite difference across, it doesn't depend on which direction I take. That's a boson of spin zero. And that corresponds to the Brout Engler Higgs boson. So the Brout Engler Higgs boson was a completely clear, unmistakable sign of a discrete structure which was present. And uh, I knew uh, Robert Brown very much, and uh, he, he was uh, very interested, of course, to know by this understanding, which is the understanding of why, uh, if you want, the experimental fight that physicists had, uh, you know, because, uh, for instance, the Brown and Higgs mechanism, it was obtained after years and years and years of thoughts of how to uh, give masses to the particles. So all the masses of the particles actually come from this mechanism. And uh, what you find out in, uh, in this model that uh, we have developed is that, uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the main ingredient, which is the matrix of masses and uh, mixing angles and so on of the particles, is in fact exactly is the uh, line element for the finite structure. So the line element for the finite structure contains exactly this information. Which means, if you want that, uh, in this model, we have a mixture of the continuum and the discrete. But the discrete contains information about the masses and mixing and the particles. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. <laughs> very good. Excellent. <laughs>